Thanks for checking out this week's message. No matter where you are, we hope that you'll be inspired and know that you're part of our one family. If you enjoy the ministry of our church, you can help us share messages like this by supporting us financially. Just press the give button at onechurchsc.org. It's quick, easy, and secure. Now let's prepare our hearts for this week's message. Luke chapter 2 this morning. We're going to look at verse 9. Uh, we'll get there in just a moment. I'm going to start a series called All. All right. Oh, shut, no. All. A-W-E. Uh, it carries the idea of amazement, uh, wonder uh, over the miraculous. Uh, I wanted to do a series on miracles uh, this Christmas season. I went back to 2014 and I did a series on miracles then at Christmas season. It's nothing like that series whatsoever. I'm in a different place in my life uh, and journey, and so God is doing some different work in my a different work in my life. So it's going to be completely different. But I want to take I want to take some of the traditional Christmas story and I want to bring them out. I don't want to take them out of context whatsoever. All right, that's not my job. My job is to rightly divide the Word of God, not add or take away from. And so I want to make sure I leave it in context, and I will. But I want to bring some truths out about how God is still a miraculous God. Do you believe in miracles? Amen. Okay. All right. Some of you do. Do you believe in miracles? Yeah. I mean, it's okay if you mean it. I mean, if you say, I, I don't know, preacher. Is that a trick question or what? Uh, we'll get there. I, I, I believe in miracles. Uh, you know, if you want to get technical, you, you being here is a miracle. All right. I, I'm, 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 I'm a saved guy. I was saved at 23. That's a, a rarity statistically. All right. Uh, they say if you don't get it when you're young, that, that it's a very slim chance that you'll get it uh, as you get older. I don't know who they are in the, uh, the stats, uh, but uh, I believe God's grace is sufficient all the time. But, yeah. but I believe in miracles. I, I, I've been uh, witness to several. I, uh, before we get into the series and before we look at uh, some of the uh, concepts and aspects of miracle this these next few weeks now we'll break in we've got children's uh, uh program coming up and we'll we'll have our christmas program like i said earlier with communion and and so but 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 as we walk through this uh what is a true miracle like i wonder if people struggle sometimes to say i believe in miracles because uh they don't understand what a true biblical sense of a miracle may be because we look back at the bible now you will be saying amen all right, buckle up, put your gospel seatbelts on. I don't have but one gear and I'm ready to go, all right? We look back at through the Bible and we say, well, we, we want to be a New Testament church. We want to we want to see, and I, and I truly believe that. I, I want to be an Acts church. I, I want to I be a church that doesn't have denominational walls, that doesn't have divisions. I want it to be a church that has freedom, that has liberty, that, that has all things in common. If you'll let me just kind of use that as a phrase, that means a whole lot. There's a whole lot of meaning in that. That, that, that statement, all right? But I, and I want us to be there, but why, why, what, what, what is a miracle? Why do we not see those kind of things that are, that are happening? And so I want to take just a moment, an introduction, just to remind you uh, and put it into context what I'm talking about when I, I say I want to talk to you about miracles and what I want to see God do in my own life, my family, and through our community here at One and our surrounding community and sister churches, all right? A miracle. I, 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 I've got all kind of definitions, right? All kind of study, all kind of software. I'm looking at all, these, all this up. I mean, just or even just the plain Webster Dictionary, what is a miracle? And uh, I run across this article by Dr. Lutzer, all right? And I like that he did this. I don't know if you're talking about this. It doesn't matter to me, all right? I, I just want to tell you what I believe God is speaking into my life. He, he said it just simply this, and I'm going to quote it. Put simply, it is when God does something, watch it, unusual. I believe that we have a misconception of the miraculous in the 21st century. I, I believe that we're not seeing the miraculous happen because I, I, I believe we don't have a true biblical understanding of what God does. Now, here, here I want you to understand something with me. God is at work all the time. Yeah. He, he, listen, he don't smoke. He don't have to take a smoke break. He don't chew, so he don't have to take a break, right? He don't run with girls that do, so he don't have to take a break. He doesn't wear a Rolex or a Timex. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He is time in itself, all right? He is, he was, and he always will be. You get it, right? And so it, 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 what is the miraculous? And God is always working, always. The very fact, now let's just get real elementary. The very fact that you can keep your, your I started to say B-U-T-T, but I got corrected last night from the children. Just the very fact that you keep your behind, is that, that's okay, right, parents? That you can keep your behind in that chair this morning is the operation of a creative God. No, it's like, like, you know, what? The fact that every time I step, I don't need a spacesuit to keep me grounded 
is a miraculous God doing something unusual because outside, as far as we have tried to find, no other place in the universe says, plural, that he holds in the palm of his hands. Okay? That's how big our God is. I don't care how far they split to Adam or how far they reach out there. They'll never find the end to him because there is no end. He's the beginning and the end. But the very fact that you're sitting there, walking, got up this morning, you get it, right? You're breathing yeah. is God's grace. Yeah. And that's miraculous. So God's always working. But every so often, he breaks from the usual pattern. And he does something unusual, mm -hmm. uncommon, amazing, miraculous. That will leave you kind of standing in, here's the reason it's called this, awe. And I think what well, a desperate need for the church in the 21st century is this. And I mean not only here at one but around the world is a sense of awe and a holy and a righteous and a big old God that can do anything and everything and that loves everybody no matter their race, their gender, their political stance, their denomination, their social status, their economics. You, you, you get it, right? That he just loves everybody. That he is love and that he is a miraculous God and that he does something unusual and I want us to be a people that are unusual. King James says he calls us a peculiar people. We just come off a two-part series, hold that thought. Who are you? You are a saint, not a sinner. If you're a blood-bought, born-again child of God, you are, yes, you still sin, but that's not your primary identity. That's just some things that you do in your stupidity, but in your ignorance. But you are a saint. You are a child of God. And that's a miraculous, unusual occurrence that you would be saved. Just think about the process of it. See, we, we dumb it down and we get over it and we, we move on and we grow up and we become dignified. We don't roll our britches up to our knee anymore. And anybody that does it just a little bit different, well, they're weird instead of saying, man, that's unusual or even miraculous. And so I just want to bring you back to the original Christmas story. I am not naive to believe that this time of the year is when Jesus was actually born, all right? <laughs> I don't want to get into that with you guys, okay? But I want to look at an account, and I want to show you so that you think you don't think I'm just making this up, but I want you to get this down. The miraculous is when God does, does, just simply does something unusual. And as far as me, just so you know who you're following, I'm tired of seeing God do the usual. I want to see something unusual. I want a bit of excellence in the effort that I put forth. I, I, I may be OCD. I may go overboard. I, I may let sometimes, sometimes my emotions overload me. And I, and I say and, and act in an inappropriate way, but that's just because I'm overly passionate and I want to see God do something. My time is limited. So as we move through this month, I want you to look and be on the lookout. Ms. Duncan, it's good to have you back in the house this morning after major back surgery. So good to see you guys back there. And Mr. Duncan, come along to make you look good this morning. All right? I got ADD. Stay with me. I want to see God do something unusual. I want him to do something unusual with me and with Sandra and with Lana and with Addie. And I want him to do something unusual in your relationships, in, in, in your ministry, in your life. I want him to do something unusual. So we need to identify why he's not doing those unusual things as we would like to see him do. He still does them. He's always operating. He never takes a break. He never stops. He's always working. And just from time to time, it's like, boom, we see the unusual. Why are we not seeing that and I want to identify a few things. But let me set it in context so you'll understand my heart this morning. You have your Bible open to Luke chapter 2. I want you to look for me and I want to highlight verse 9. I want to highlight verse 9. It'll be on the screen if you do not have a copy of God's Word with you or your device open there. Now, you, you, you get, you, you, you've, I don't know if Charlie Brown's already aired this year, but you, you, you got the Charlie Brown. You, you got Luke chapter 2, right? Y'all know it's, you know, the Christmas story. I mean, you got this, right? I mean, you... you so you can jump right in there with me, right? He's, he's going to, he, an angel's going to appear to the shepherd. So this is a story. And again, I'm going to just dive right in. Verse 9, it says this. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, them being the shepherds. Remember, we, we kind of we understand what we're talking about, the shepherds. And the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. And, and, and there's, if, you have, if you have the New Living Translation or you'll see it on the screen, uh, these are the three words that inspired this entire series. I, mean, I don't know how many messages I'll preach, but... This, this is, I can't get over this, okay? And they were terrified. If you have a King James, uh, and maybe even New King James, it says they were sore afraid. 
I kind of like that, 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 that beautiful English. I kind of like that, that old English there. Terrified, the word translate. I, I'm not saying that I'm a better scholar than any of you or any of those that, that have translated the Bible or anything like that. But I, I just want to kind of break down something to you and for you this morning when they say they were terrified. See, if you take it at face value and you just, you just surface, you just read through it at the Christmas time or have somebody read it or read it to your kids, you would say, well, they were, so, yeah, okay, the word suddenly, it throws the idea that they were startled, right? And they were terrified and terrified or so afraid means, man, they were shaken to the core and they were, they were horrified and they, they, were, they, were, they were hearing noises like, shh, 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 and they were just all afraid, like they was about to be murdered or something, right? And so we have to be very careful that, that we don't read into it what's, what's really not there. See, the idea when we do a little word study, they were terrified. It, it literally, it literally denotes or, or carries with it the idea that, yes, that, watch this. From their usual routine, y'all picking up what I'm laying down. From their usual routine, they're just shepherding their sheep, doing their thing, kicking it like always, right? Yeah. And then, all of a sudden, boom, in the sky, the glory of the Lord is shown around the angel. And so this suddenness, yes, it startles them. So when they translate this word, it does mean that they were scared, all right? If you let me put it in country terms, they, they were scared, okay? But it wasn't because of God's glory, because he tells them that they say, don't be afraid. I bring good news, right? You, you get the Christmas story. But it, it, it doesn't mean that they were like, I, I'm so terrified. I, I'm going to die. They're going to kill me. I'm overwhelmed by this. It was almost like they were startled. And then here's, here's what we'll miss if we don't study this thing out. Is that yes, they were shocked at his suddenness, right? It caught him off guard. He was doing something unusual. He was doing something miraculous. You pick it up what I'm laying down. And so they were like, oh. And then they were like, wow. Wow. Oh. Hey, do you see that? He's talking to us. And you know why it was so shocking to them? You know why it was like so amazing to them? You know why it was so miraculous to them? Because according to history, hey, shepherds were the outcast. They were often viewed as the outcast, the common. They, they smelled bad. You know why they smelled bad, right? Well, they run with sheep. You, you, if you go to Africa with us, you'll, you'll pick up real quick that, that some of the odor in the homes is because they keep their livestock in there with them. And it can be overwhelming. And according to the Bible, that a good shepherd will lay down his life. A good shepherd lays down with his sheep. A good shepherd knows his sheep and the sheep know his voice. And so you understand the principle that's being taught here spiritually more deep than what's just on the surface. And so I want you to get this. And at this Christmas time, at this season of the year, that, that I want to see God do something unusual. Yes. If you're a parent, you can identify. Maybe I can put it in the more practical application for you that you can identify with the shepherd this night. Uh, and see yourself as this common and how that you're usual will become unusual. Do you, do you remember when your child, if they are there or have already passed this stage, do you remember when your child was learning to walk? Or if you've worked, volunteered, maybe you, you're not biologically a mom or dad, but you've helped with children and been around children and, and, and so on and so forth, or, or foster. Do you remember when your kid was learning to walk? And so that child, they, they began to, 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 to get up from the crawl. They began to prop themselves up. They began to, to, to do that drunken baby drunk. You know what I'm saying? Like they got the... This weird stagger to them, and, and, and then you're like you're like scared because you're afraid they're going to bump their head, especially if it's your first kid. If it's your first kid, everything's freaky, right? Because you've got little bumpers on everything, and every I mean, you just by the time I, and I only have two, so but they say by the time the third and fourth, it's like who cares? Go, right? Whatever. Are they with us even? Uh, but but you remember, right? You're, everything you're, you're like, you're like and, and so that that baby just that child begins to take its first step, and you're like, ah, and you've got this fear. Or the first day of school, or you, you, you get what I'm saying, and they, they begin to take that step, and you're like, oh, don't let them fall, don't get hurt, don't let them break anything, don't, whatever. But then once you realize that, 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 that out of that drunken waddle, they, they begin to actually make steps and make progress, and then, then you go, run, Forrest, run. And, and, and it's like, whoa, I made that. This is what, this is what the ship, this is, this is the word awe. This is the word amazing. This is the word miraculous. That he does something unusual. Among the uncommon. Why are we not so in awe of our God in the 21st century? Why this morning are we not in awe and come expecting God to do a miraculous thing? And some of you go, preacher I am, amen. Come on, let's be real. Yeah. When's the last time you have seen sight back to the blind or, or the dead raised to life? 
or, or, or the deaf receive their hearing. And some of us have been part and, and, and been privy or in the presence of miraculous things happening like that. But, but come on, let's, let's be real for a moment. I mean, how many of you, if you don't want to go to that extreme, how many of you are in a stage of your life that you're, 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 you're praying and you're praying and you're praying and you're praying and you're like, God, I want to break. You may not use these words, but because it's on my heart and it's the message this morning that the Holy Ghost has put in my heart, is you're like, I'm so tired of the same old, same old. Why do I keep making these mistakes? Why can I not get, I thought at this age I would be here and I would have this and I thought things would turn out this way. And I thought, why is it that you keep asking God that it's, that it's just the usual, that God, I just need something unusual to happen in my life. And yet you still seem to be in that same rut, that same cycle. And, and, and this let me say to you, it may be because you don't have a biblical concept of what he means by the miraculous. That, that, that you, you don't really understand what he's talking about by, by being in awe of him. Yeah. And being amazed at how he will come to the common and to the simple and he will do something that, that seemingly not. Mind you, the sky parting and a light in the sky and an angel speaking is incredible, Right? But I think the concept of what I'm talking about and what God would have me to translate to you and to be like the FedEx man and just drop off a package for you this morning so you can have it and do with it what God would allow you to do with it is that we sometimes miss it because we're looking for all of this when God said, what about right in front of you? Amen. Why, why are we not in that? Why are we not like, whoa? And I understand. Now, now listen to me before I get into this. I believe, I believe with all my heart that miracles still happen every day, all right? I've tried to explain that, simplify that. I think God does the unusual every day. I, I think, though, the reason a lot of times we miss it is what, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's two extreme camps. There are those that are in this extreme camp that they that see and think that everything's a, whoa, that's a miracle. That parking spot opened and I got this, that's a, thank you for the miracle, God. And everything's a miracle, or, 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 or the cat, you know, the dog, or the kids, or the, you know, I mean, every little thing is, is, is all a miracle. And then there's the other camp that's extreme, the opposite of that, that just absolutely says no miracle in anything. Like, you haven't stopped to think about the, the fact that the trees put off what you and I need to live. You, I mean, the very fact that you can bring, the very fact that the earth is on a certain axis, right? I'm always hammering that one, right? I mean, because God blew my mind. It's like, I'm just going to put you just like this. So you don't freeze and so you don't burn until I'm ready for you to. Yeah. And so I want to get us to a place where we don't live in either one of those extreme camps, but we understand biblically what it means for God to do something unusual or the miraculous. And why is he not? Let, let's look at the first thing. I, it, it, let me get right to it. I think the first thing that, that the reason that he didn't perform, he don't perform these miracles and do the, the unusual is, watch this, Jesus refused to do miracles to prove himself. Yeah. Jesus refused to do miracles to prove himself. I give to the media team verses that would back this up. Remember, do not lose track of where we launched from, okay? But let's develop this thought out about why we don't see God do the unusual. God will not perform a miracle to prove himself. Mark chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. Mark chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had arrived, they came and started to argue with him, testing him, trying to get him to prove himself. They demanded that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. Verse 12 says, when, when Jesus heard this, when he heard this, he sighed deeply. Are you kidding me? Really? He sighed deeply. In his spirit and said, why do these people keep demanding a miraculous sign? And, and, and listen, if you had not already caught on, Jesus don't ask a question that he don't already know the answer to. All right? Why do they keep asking for a miraculous sign? I'll tell you the truth. I will not give this generation any such sign. God don't have to prove anything to you. God will not do something unusual if you keep saying to God, hey, if you change these three red lights to green, I'll know it's you. God, if you, if you, if you let them play this song at imitation time, I, I know that I, I, that's you speaking to me. 
God, if you make this or you make that, God, if you give me, and listen, don't look at me piously because we find ourselves in this same trap. God, if you'll make this happen, if you'll line these things up, if God, if you're, and listen, I'm not suggesting that you don't put your fleece out. That's biblical. But we often as humans, moving by the flesh and not operating by the spirit, we'll get to a place where we say, God, we, we don't really say it because we're scared to say it, but we mean it. And remember, God, he knows the motive, all right? And, and we say, we're basically saying, God, if you're real, then prove yourself. Uh. I mean, if God, if, you, if you've got me, then prove yourself. And I promise you this, I promise you, you will never see God do something unusual in your life if you live your life in this cycle that you want God to continually prove himself. As a matter of fact, I would venture to say to you, or I would advise you to get to a place in your prayer life where you quit saying, God, like, for instance, I get up here, God, help me preach, help me speak, help me do this, help me not look bad. What's it got to do with my looks? Yeah. That's a wrong kind of prayer. God, don't help me. Don't help me not look bad. God, help me rightly divide your word. God, help me glorify you from the meditations of my heart. My mouth speak to you. May you be pleased with what I say. May you be the one that I am glorifying and that I am pleasing and not the people that are here or not here or worrying about those things. God, you don't prove how good I am by the crowd that shows up or the amount of salvations that happen or the discipleship that takes place. That's on you, God. I don't need you to prove those things. I just simply need you to do something unusual in my life. Yeah. And the Pharisees always wanted a sign. Now, he'll get those signs. Now, stay tied to the original text. But God's not going to... But you know why signs are so, so, so dangerous? Because one sign's not enough. Yeah. Let's go back to being a parent for a moment. I told you I'm in the thick of raising my kids, so, hey, get over it. Do you remember when you're trying to entertain your kid uh, or try to keep up with your kid uh, and, you, and you do something and, and, and really before they know that you're just a big, big, big as doofus as they are and they still think that you're some magician or you can do crazy things because you go, oh, I'm here. No, I'm not. Here I am. Whoa. And the kid is like blown away. And, and, and here's what happens, right? You, you do it one time just to kind of appease them because you're in a setting and, and maybe in a restaurant and you do this one thing one time. You say, I'm never going to do it again. But this one time, i got to get through this time right now. Guess what they want you to do? <laughs> do it again, daddy. Do it again, daddy. Do it again, daddy. Do it again, daddy. Do it again. Uh, do it again, daddy. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. You say, well, that's just a kid. No, no, no. That's human nature. Amen. If God was just about the signs, if he was just about proving himself because he made the red lights change or made where you walk comfortable or how you talk better or where you sleep warmer or because he just done those things, then what in the world would he need to die on Calvary's cross for? Yeah. God's not going to do anything unusual if you show up and saying, God, I need you to prove yourself that I'm here for me. No. I didn't come here for myself this morning. Yeah. Most Sunday mornings, believe it or not, I know this is a shock to you, I don't even really feel worthy to be here. I told you I struggled with that identification between a sinner and a saint. God will not do the unusual in amongst a bunch of people that all they want is for him to prove himself and to show so that we can post on Facebook how many salvations we have, how big our crowd is, how well we look, how our lights are, how nice we have this or how many staff we have or all that good stuff. You, you all right? Yes. God's not going to do something unusual. If all you do is say, I want you to prove yourself, signs are dangerous. Signs are dangerous because one's just never enough. Signs can deceive you. Devil hears you too. Ooh. Demons know the word better than you according to the word. Preach. As a matter of fact, this is what keeps me in check, keeps my toes to the rug, keeps me in check, is he says that there'll come a day that there'll be those that he will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. And they will beg back to him, God, but did we not preach, prophesy in your name, and cast out demons, and do all the, or do these miraculous things in your name? And he still says to them, see you, son. So there are people literally right now that are filling the sacred desk and doing the work that they think of the kingdom, but they're not doing it for the kingdom with a capital K. They're doing it with the kingdom with a little K. Because they're caught up in the signs. They're caught up in this, this thing that we see as productivity. And it validates
hurts us and it strokes our ego and it makes us think better of ourselves. It makes us think better of our denomination. It makes us, it makes us feel better about ourselves in general. I told somebody this morning, they was like, I'm trying to walk with the umbrella. And, and they were like, they was like, we really don't need the umbrella. I was like, don't worry about it. I'm not doing it for you anyway. I'm doing it for me. It's making me feel good. I'm serving. Now, I was being facetious, but I guarantee you there are a lot of people that if the truth were revealed, the reason they serve, preach, teach, and God help us lead is for self-satisfaction and self-glorification. I think that's why I come to the shepherds first. They're already nobodies. They're already in the gutter. And the reason God's not doing anything unusual is because he will not do something where you demand that he... He, he proved himself. Let me give you one more reason that I think signs or, 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 or him, you asking him to prove himself dangerous. Not only one sign is never enough, signs can be deceiving, but hey, the word trumps every sign. Hey, you walk by faith and not by sight. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. It doesn't come out of signs. Yeah, amen. Do you remember when, when Moses throws down his staff and it turns and, and, they, and they go, wait a minute, hey, the, 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 the sorcerer, the trickster, Merlin and his crew is like, oh, we can do that. You have to be careful. You have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You have to understand that God's not going to do anything just to prove himself. He doesn't have to. He's already given the ultimate sign, and that was Christ on Calvary's cross. It was like the bronze serpent in the Old Testament. It was just that foretold. It was a foreshadowing of Christ. Under He said, if you lift me up, I will draw all men and women unto myself. Mm -hmm. Ultimate sign's already been given. God will not do anything unusual if you ask him to prove himself. You may not use those words verbatim, but you know your heart and your spirit. And above that, God knows your heart and your spirit. As a matter of fact, Romans 1.20 and Psalm 19.1, if all of creation testifies about the creator, why should he have to give you a personal sign from heaven for you to get busy living for him? Some of you are hanging on, you're waiting to surrender your life or to rededicate your life or to get back in the game because you're like, God, I need you to show me. I need you to help me. I need you to do this. And I know there's seasons of healing, but I'm telling you some of the greatest things that if I've learned over the 40 years, uh, uh, 43 years of my life and the 20 plus years of ministry is that, that healing takes place as I am serving. It's almost like if a person's unhealthy and they are stuck in a bed, because you'd say, well, they, they, they're on bed rest and they need to rest. Yeah, but if you don't every so often move even those that are on bed rest, guess what they get? Right. Bed sores. Yeah. And they do more damage than probably what is ailing the person that's laying in the bed. Y'all all right? Yeah. You can't just sit there and say, okay, God, if you do this, if you bring my mom back, if you bring my dad back, if you save him, if you save her, if you bring my daughter out of that drug and I'm not saying that you should stop praying for them. I'm just saying that you're not going to see God do anything in your life until you absolutely move to a place where you say, God, I simply will walk by faith and not by sight. Because most of the things I see are scary. God will not do the unusual. He will not do the miraculous. If all we're after is for him to prove himself, he's already proven himself. And I promise you, if you're like the Pharisees and you're asking him to prove himself to you, you will continually find yourself disappointed like the Pharisees. There'll be an emptiness. The second reason I believe we don't see God do the unusual or the miraculous, the reason we're not in all of him like we should be and could be, is because Jesus never performed a miracle that interfered with God's ultimate plan. This was huge. Matthew 26, 53, let me just prove a point, just using Jesus himself as the example. In Matthew 26, verse 53, Jesus is standing there, he's on trial, and he says, to him, I love this, man, he's like, let me, I, let, just for a moment, time out, I'm going to remind you who's really the big boss. And he says this, he says, don't you realize that I can ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us, and we, he would send them instantly? It's like, don't, don't, don't think for a second that I, if I wanted to see it done a different way, that it could be done a different way. But this is not God's plan. If he would have saved 
saved himself from the cross, then he would have bypassed or skipped the miraculous on the third day. And so often we want God to do something unusual, but, but what we don't realize and what we're not sensitive to is that God has a plan for us. Even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God has a plan for us. Remember, he never stops working. It's like the old church sign, which I can't stand church signs, but it's like the old church sign. Something like this. God didn't move, you did. I don't remember what catchy, cheesy thing it said, but the basis of it was, if God didn't move, you moved. It took a team of scientists to come up with that phrase, but God doesn't move. God doesn't take a break. He doesn't take timeouts. He's always working. But God is not going to do anything that would throw or tow off what his plan is ultimately for your life. I, I wrote these two things down and tied them out here. God always has a plan. He's always working. God always has a purpose. I want to take a moment, and I know that some of you know this story, and I've heard it more than once, but I want to share it again because it, 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 it just absolutely will put application to what I'm talking about. And I don't have any story but my own story. You've heard me talk about my mom, and you've heard me talk about the season that she was in the hospital. You see, my mother went in for a routine surgery at Oconee. She was going to have uh, a hernia operated and fixed that she had not taken care of since my baby brother had been born. And it, was, it had turned septic, and it was sending poison from her feet up. You could see her turning a different color. She was becoming dark purple. And so the surgeon that was supposed to perform the surgeon, the surgeon that we are familiar with, he's not there. But they tell me that if she didn't have the surgery immediately, that she won't live for the weekend. So my brother and my dad, they said, well, what do we do? We have surgery. And so before they could do the surgery, I, I'm going to give you the, 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 the synopsis. Of, before they could have the surgery, my mother was prone to blood clots. So they had to go in and put what I think, if I remember correctly, it's called a Greenfield filter. They had to put it in her main artery in her leg. But to get to that artery, to that place in her leg, they had to go through her heart. They had to go from here down. Well, what they did not know, the team that were working on her, the surgeon that we didn't know, that we were not really familiar with, did not know, was that as they were guiding that wire down, and no one knew until after the fact, when they were trying to guide that wire down, it had bunched up. Now, they, they realized what had happened, but didn't say anything to us. That wire had bunched up. It wasn't going through. It bunched up. And so it, it poked a hole in the sack that holds your heart. And so when she come out of surgery, they, they fixed that, right? They, 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 they didn't fix the hole, but they fixed that, got the Greenfield filter in. She went through the surgery. And, and when she, later that night, somewhere around midnight, she began to wake up from that surgery. So that surgery was successful. It corrected the hernia, got the poison, and began to, you know, with transfusion, began to do work. But what they didn't tell us and didn't want us to know was the sac was burst and held her heart. Well, one of the cardiologists come by later to check her, and they said... You got to get her to Greenville right now. Goodness. So they met back to her to Greenville Memorial. We met with a heart surgeon. When we got over there, my pastor at the time, he met me and he pulled me to the side and he said, now I know you know this because this is what God's called you to do, but you better be ready. Because when they pull you in that little room when you first get here, that's usually a bad sign. And so the heart surgeon of the day, nicknamed Cowboy, we would later discover, he comes in the room and he goes out and he said, and he used a few choice words which I, I absolutely appreciated. He said, we have to surgery now if you want to give her a chance to live. And so after three or four major open heart surgeries split all the way wide open, we find her in ICU, the CVICU unit at Greenville Memorial at this time, <clears throat> fighting for her life. She would never come off a ventilator. As a matter of fact, she would be on a ventilator so long that they would have to put a check. She could only be on a ventilator so long before they have to put the trach in so that they can remove it every so often, pneumonia and other things don't happen. And so they, 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 she never come off a machine. She did wake up because in the palm of my hand, when we'd go in during visit time, she would, <laughs> she would write home, H-O-M-E in my hand. And I thought she wanted to go to, to you know, you've heard this story, please stay with me. I, I thought she wanted to go to, to 104 Clearwater Drive, which is where my parents' house was at the time. 
She, I believe with all my heart she was ready to go home. Home. I mean, I mean, my mother looked awful. Suffering tremendously. And so for a month she lived on this machine and, and ultimately she would lose her battle. She would, she would go into renal failure. Organs would begin to shut down and she, she just basically lost her battle. And I was mad. Oh my gosh, I was mad. I was experiencing incredible revival. I was in my first ministry. You see, I was a high school dropout. I chose to rebel against my mom and dad and do things crazy in the world. It broke my mother's heart. I didn't graduate high school. I ended up getting a GED, going back and getting a high school equivalency. Uh, I've, got, I've got two class rings. I quit in the 12th grade in 93, and I have a 94 class ring as well. Anyway, but I was never able to walk and give her my diploma. So she was, at least God's grace, was able to see me graduate college. When I walked off the college stage, I took my college diploma, my first, my first degree, my associate's degree. I took that down to my mother and gave it to her. I broke all the rules, and I didn't care what they said. I was going to walk over to my mother in the wheelchair and give her that. I was devastated. The church that they told me not to go past, they were running about 18 when I got there. You don't want that to be your first church. My God, they had this, 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 the Baptist church. They're old school. They don't, man, they don't want every preacher they run off. You don't want that. I said, what I want. Sure. Hundreds are showing up. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I mean, they, 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 they couldn't explain. There'd be altar calls. They'd, they'd be 20. They'd be 30. They'd be 18. They'd be 15. They'd, I mean, it was just crazy. We, we was leading the association because I was in the Baptist Association. That little church on the backside of Westminster, which is the backside of the desert. On to go out. No offense to people who live on the backside of Westminster, by the way. We led every church in the association. Jim, you guys there. You, you know. I mean, it was incredible. And I was so mad at God because I had this going right. And yet he took the most valuable thing to me ever. The person that brought stability to me. The person that could talk me off the ledge. The person that had barely a high school diploma herself, but was so wise. And he took her from me. And I was mad, and I, I said things like this, and I'll remind you again. I said things like this. I said, God, if you were going to take her, why in the world would you let her suffer for a month on the machine? I was, I was mad. I was PO'd. I'll say it like that so those younger folks... I'm trying. And you know this, you know this part of the story, but let me, let me, let me just, this is just one of many things that happened during the time that my mom was on that machine. Some of the people that she worked with come over and they brought with them Miss McKern. You know the story, stay with me. Well, Miss McKern didn't really know much about my family and knew my mom from what once was called Sangamo or Itron and her years of work there. Well, in her visit there, before my mom died into the CVIC unit, she, she began to ask questions about me and my family, found out I was a pastor, where I was a pastor. She lived in the Westminster area. And so, long story short, I get back in the pulpit immediately after I buried my mother. Miss McKern comes to one Sunday morning service. We go visit Miss McKern, Alan White and I do, that following Monday. That same visit, she told us about her brother-in-law and her sister, her sweet sister and her hellish devil brother-in-law. And when y'all leave, will you go by and visit him? So we got the address, and we went to visit. And as far as I could tell, he wasn't the devil. I mean, he didn't really act like he cared if I was there or not. Boy, but Miss Edna makes the greatest potato salad I've ever ate to this day. Sweetest woman this side of heaven. We told her about the church. We told her all the different things. Invited her to come, and guess what happened the next Sunday? Not only is Miss McKern there with her family, but her sister and her devil of a husband. I'm just quoting her. He's in service. And lo and behold, at invitation time, I see Miss Edna. She makes her way out of a pew. This is a traditional, typical Baptist church. She makes her way out of the pew and makes her way down to the center where I'm standing. And she can barely control her tears and her emotion, and she rededicates her life. She tells about a time that she give her life to Jesus Christ, and she, she just said, but I've gotten so wayward, I, I, blah, 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 and she give her life, to, you know, rededicate her life to Christ. Well, hey, a few seconds go by, and guess what happens, right? You guys have heard the story, but those that have guess what happens? You know, you know, right? Well, Bobby, he's like, well, follow my wife. He steps out. Ah. <laughs> He makes his way down to me, and I promise you this, under God is my witness. When he stands before me, he's literally, 
And when I take his hands, now I'm Baptocostal, so I understand if you think this is weird. But when I took him by his hands, it was I mean, it was, I mean, it was like, it was like, bang! I never experienced anything like that in my life. And it was like this power, this moment, like, bam! Yes. And he just went, blah! Yes. And God radically saved this man in his 60s. And he would become a deacon. And to, as far as my knowledge, they're still as faithful as they've ever been, even with their health issues, to the Baptist Church in Westminster. You see, what I'm trying to get you to understand is that sometimes God, well, he'll do something unusual, but it won't be like you think it ought to be because you can't throw his plans. Yes. His ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are deeper. than We're finite and he's infinite. And I didn't understand the full grasp of what was going on when my mother was laying there suffering. But if she had not been there suffering, Hallelujah. they would not have come over to visit and the kingdom of God would not have been impacted and this is Mr. Bobby and Miss Edna would not. And guess what? I, I've never had this to the story, but I am this morning. Their grandson who's grown, who's had a terrible time with drugs and alcohol and women, he, he guess what happens? He gives his life to Jesus Christ. I'm proud to say, just talked with him yesterday in the gym for about 15 or 20 minutes. He's happily married. He's got two yes. autistic boys that are absolutely rascals from heaven. And I'm telling you, and he served the Lord faithfully. He's been to seminary. He's educated. And he's passionately oh, serving the Lord. And if God had providentially let my mama suffer and go through what she had gone through, the miraculous, the unusual, would have not happened. Amen, Pastor. You see, you'll want smooth sailing. I had the church, I had the church want to crucify me. I had the church, you'll understand. I, I get it. They, they, they didn't even want to feed me, did they? They didn't want to give me a meal. You're unworthy and you're unfit. And I'm telling you, that's what I really wanted to hear at a time where my wife had left me and my daughter and I didn't know what I was going to do, where I was going to live, or how I was going to pay for anything, especially feed my daughter. And along the process, I absolutely considered ultimately taking it and being done with it all. But in the midst of my great tragedy, what I thought was falling apart, I watched God make it fall in place. Amen. And he would send people in my life that would surround me and that would encourage me and it would say, don't stop, don't give up, keep going. Did I like what I went through? Am I an advocate for divorce? No. That's why I don't do any marital counseling. I understand the devastation of brokenness. I understand the hypocrisy in the church. I understand the detriment of God's people who say they're God's people absolutely turning on you. But guess what? It was one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. You're blessed by me. Check it out. Oh, this is good stuff. You stop for a moment and think about yourself, but let's stop for a moment and think about West Degal, Salinas Degal. And let's think about, let's think for just a moment about Selena's brother and his wife. And let's stop a moment and let's think about at the time three children that didn't have, listen to me, that would eventually not have a home unless they were put in the system. That if we hadn't launched the church, if, we, if I had evolved into the fact that the church is the worst thing in the world and the people are evil and they're liars and they're demons and you get the point but yet those people around me said no 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 listen and God's working something out God's doing something he's not going to stop it just to make you feel better he's going to have his plan he's going to go to the cross he's going to do something great then there would not be no land of banana in my life and you are you are greatly blessed and three other kids. And God wouldn't have providentially placed them in your life. 
and they get to do life together on a pretty regular basis. Do you understand what I'm saying here when I say, watch this, that God is always working, but he will not do anything to break his plan. He has a purpose for your life. And I know you may feel broken right now, but in your brokenness, I promise you, your blessings will fly. Right. The shepherds, outcast, stinky, common, nobodies. I imagine just a usual life for them, just themselves. And God does something unusual. Because he's always got a plan and he's always got a purpose. And, and I, share, I share those couple of stories with you and definitely to, to say this, that through those processes, through, through those seasons of my life, it strengthened my faith. Yeah. So I'm going to give you the third thing, is, and I believe the reason that God doesn't do the miraculous things or the unusual things. The third one is this, I, I think Jesus didn't do miracles where there was no faith. Uh, Matthew 13, 58, as we close, he said this, he said, he did only a few miracles there in his hometown because of their unbelief, their lack of faith. Now, some would believe that their lack of faith might have meant that, well, they didn't ask Jesus. The other might have meant that they didn't have enough faith. I think they both can coexist. But what I want to do as I close this morning, I want to get you to a place that, that we end on this note of faith and how important our faith is and how we don't look for him to prove himself and we don't look because it's not going just like we think it ought to go or it don't feel good or it's difficult. I didn't know how I was going to pay the bills. I had to sell. I, man, I, listen, I promise you, He's going to have his way, and he has a plan, and he has purpose, but ultimately it's to strengthen our faith, and in, in this process, I want you to get, I want you to think about how faith moves the heart of God. I want you to understand that there was a woman with the issue of blood for 12 years that said, if I could just press in and touch the hem of his garment, and when she did, he said this, he says, daughter, in Mark 5, 34, he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. There was a man that, that was dying with leprosy that fell at his feet and worshipped him. And in Luke 17, 19, Jesus says, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. There was a blind man that screamed out, have mercy on me. And in, in, in Mark 10, 52, Jesus says, go. Jesus said, your faith has made you well. Your faith. Faith moves the heart of God. Faith. So if you're here this morning and you, you find yourself like the, like the shepherds, the, the, the outcasts, the, the seemingly unworthy, or you find yourself like the woman with the issue of blood or the man with leprosy or the blind man, you find yourself, listen to me, you find yourself desperate. Good. It's a prerequisite to God doing something miraculous or unusual. Desperate. And then you've got to be daring. The shepherd, they would tell him to go, and they would be, and they would be daring. The woman would reach out and touch the hem of his garment. You gotta be daring. You gotta be willing to say, "I don't feel saved. I don't feel sanctified. I don't feel. It don't look. It don't seem." You gotta be willing to be just as desperate as all get out and be daring to say, "I'm gonna step out of the boat. I'm gonna walk by faith and not by sight." I'm going to take this moment of awe that God would really still love me and use me and call me and have a plan for me and a purpose for me. And I'm going to be daring based on that truth. And then watch this. Listen to me and be determined that no matter what, I'm going to get mine. They're not going to steal my joy. She's not going to defeat. He's not going to. They are not. It's not. He is. So you got to be desperate. you got to be daring. Stop playing it safe. Stop retreating to the cave, Elijah. Come out. There's more for you than against you. And be determined. Stand your feet, please. Out of time. You see, if you're desperate and you're daring and you're determined... That's a good setup for a miracle. For God to do something unusual. Now watch this. I'm going to flip the script on you in just a moment, okay? There's a story in the Bible about these five guys. One of the five guys couldn't walk. was paralyzed. But his four friends heard Jesus had come back to Capernaum. 
And so his four friends said, hey, we got to get Tom, Dick or Harry, whatever his name, Bubba. We got to get him to Jesus. He was desperate. So they were desperate. So when they get, they get the friend, you know the story, right? Stay with me. When they get the friend to the house, the friend, because it was noise that Jesus was in town and he was doing those things and he was healing and he was teaching on next level kingdom stuff, it was so packed they couldn't get in. And you know the story, right? They was like, wait a minute. They didn't go home. They didn't quit because it didn't go their way. God had a plan. He had a purpose. And so they sought God in it. And they were like, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. One of them, that's why one of them probably named Bubba. They were like, hmm. Let's climb up there. And let's tear the roof out. And they look and they go, wait a minute, it's a long way down. It's a long way down. He's already paralyzed. Might as well go ahead and let him go. And drop him down in. Now what's interesting about this story is this. Watch this. If you're not careful, you'll only see that he says, Jesus says to him, which he says, your sins are forgiven. But see, right before he says that, if it's translated right, I don't know how the King James, but, but in, the, in the NLT, it, 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 it literally says that Jesus, God, this is so good, this is incredible. Jesus sees their faith. Who's they? The four friends that were just as desperate, that were just as daring, and that were determined. I end with that story to say this. And sometimes it's the people in your life that will create the atmosphere for your miracle. Sometimes you don't have it in you. Your faith is waning. The world beats you up and spits you out. And that's why it's important to put yourself in a community of people that are just as desperate, that are just as daring, and are just as determined to do whatever it takes to get you to the king. Because it says he saw their faith. And then he forgives his sin. You might be the miracle, the unusual, that she's been waiting on, that he's been waiting on. But you're still hiding in the cave. I want to encourage you to come forward. Maybe God put somebody on your heart and you need to reach out to them. Maybe they're here this morning. No better place to do business of reconciliation and refreshment and revival than in an old-fashioned altar. I know it's a high school auditorium. I don't care what it looks like. What I know that it is is a place that's been anointed, cried over, and prayed over, and sanctified over to a holy and righteous and a redeeming God. I want God to do something unusual. Because He is an unusual God. And I'm sick of letting Hollywood and the world and other churches and Hollywood pastors yeah. and hypocrites and deacons and elders define who God is. This season is filled with miracles. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Wonder, root, awe, amazed. The shepherds would be obedient. They would be obedient to go and they would get to see the greatest sign of all, common average, overlooked even people. So I don't know where you are in your journey, but I can promise you this, God loves you. And let me tell you something, if you keep thinking that it's about the size of your faith, then you don't understand the Bible at all. For as you were saying this morning, you had no idea that this is what was already on my heart. You see, you look at that text and it says he didn't do many works there because of their lack of faith or their unbelief. And you may look at it and you're reading to it they just didn't have the right amount of faith. Okay, maybe there is some truth in that. But according to God in the entirety of the 66 canonized books that we have, 